So welcome, uh, welcome to The Foster. My name is Matthias Lanis. Today we're very fortunate to have Skylar Doherty and Matthew Hepworth, who traveled with Tony in Nepal and were doing the Annapurna circuit um, and all the way up to Machaputre Mountain. This was in April of 2014. A little background about them. Skylar Dougherty grew up in San Diego and he studied both earth system science and management science and engineering at Stanford University. He now works for a clean energy finance company and enjoys getting outside in the mountains as much as possible. Matthew Hepworth grew up in Boise, Idaho, and completed a BS and MS at Stanford as well, studying topics in climate science and engineering, and he now works in San Francisco for a utility infrastructure analytics company. So, please give them a warm welcome. Um, thank you all for coming out, and thank you, Jane, for inviting us, uh, not only on the trip, but to share the experience with everyone. Uh, so who we are. I am on the left there as well as now, and I'm Matt Hepworth. Um, I'm, as uh, Matias said, I'm from Boise, Idaho originally. Met Skyler at Stanford. Um, we were in the same major and also lived in the same house for a number of years. Uh, and through that time, just became pretty good friends and figured out that we enjoy a lot of uh, the same stuff. And part of that has a uh, lot to do with enjoying the wilderness. So um, I was sort of fortunate enough to tag on to, to his connections um, and be part of this. Yeah, so Matt and I were living together in Palo Alto doing our masters at Stanford, and we were graduating in March, and we both had jobs that started in September, so naturally we had this great window of opportunity to go travel, and we knew we wanted to go to Asia and visit our friend in Vietnam, we wanted to go to Europe, and just have very vague plans, um, but had, um, you know, uh, big dreams to go do <laughs> some fun adventures, and we didn't know what they were going to be. Um, <clears throat> so this whole trip came about because Jane Woodward, the founder of The Foster, um, is my godmother. So I've known Aunt Jane my whole life, and um, this is Jane and myself and my brother Galen. Um, so she knew I was going to be traveling, and she's obviously well connected with Tony, and knew Tony was going um, as part of his... Um, uh, journey to visit Machu Picchu and, and paint Machu Picchu. So she reached out to both of us and connected us and said, hey, why don't you guys meet and um, see if you guys are interested in um, combining your trips. So that was kind of the fortuitous um, background to how the trip came about. And Tony, Tony was very open to the idea. He said, that sounds great, um, but surely wanted to meet us and kind of feel us out before committing to going on a month-long trip with us in Nepal. So um, it came about that Tony was going to be in town, and we met at Jane's for breakfast with Tony. Yep. So I knew, like, nothing about who Tony was, but Skylar, Jane had given Skylar a book and kind of brought it back to our house and was saying, you know, hey, here's this artist, he's this really cool guy, he's doing all these cool paintings, like, maybe all this unstructured vacation time we have, we could just go to Nepal with him for a big chunk of that. Um, which obviously was super exciting and cooler than anything we'd come up with so far. Um, and so we went over, had breakfast with him, and started looking at maps and like really planning everything out. And it was during the sort of looking at maps and saying, you know, okay, yeah, we're going to fly into Kathmandu and head over to the Annapurna range and kind of like, you know, what should we do in this month when you're painting, like, you know, but we probably don't want to stay around the whole time. Anyways, Kurt uh, sort of over, started overhearing all this and thinking about past trips and talked himself into going in like the half hour that we were planning it out. Um, so our, our party immediately grew by one. Uh, and then that, that was kind of, you know, we met Tony. He, he decided that we weren't complete jerks and uh, sort of started working through the logistics of, of allowing us to come. So um, for a little bit of reference, that the red circle is kind of a, a rough representation of um, the range we were in, the, the Annapurna Circuit, and then heading up into the Annapurna Sanctuary, and then, you know, Kathmandu is over here, more, more near the center of the fall. Yeah. It's so... A, it's a sanctuary? <clears throat> yeah. yeah. It's called, <laughs> called the Annapurna Sanctuary, and it's, it's a protected, um, you know, area in Nepal. So just zooming in on that red circle, this... This red outline is what's known as the Annapurna Circuit, and it's a really um, popular trekking destination 
Um, most people do it in, I think, three weeks in total. Um, but this is kind of the map that we whipped out and we were hashing out with Tony. Um, Tony's plan was um, Machu Picchari, I don't know if there's a laser, the green one. Machu Picchari is right here in the middle. And so the, the circuit kind of circumnavigates this whole range. There are a lot of really huge mountains in the middle. And Tony's plan was to spend some time out here painting Machu Picchari from a distance and then take this blue route, which is the Annapurna Sanctuary trek um, up to Annapurna Base Camp right here, which is where um, you can really see Machu Picchari up close. So that was Tony's plan. And we, and we worked out with him that while he was down here painting for a couple weeks, we would zoom around here and then meet him right around here and, and do this in about a week with him. So we'll first kind of go through this adventure, which was um, a whole trip on its own. And then we linked up with Tony and got to spend some good time with him in there. Um, as Matt said, our, our trip kind of originated with Tony. Uh, Kurt, uh, Jane's husband, quickly tagged on. And Tony likes to, to bring a group on his trip, A, because it's more fun from him when he's not you know, just in the evenings or on the trail to, to have partners. Um, and B, it, it's you know, more business for his Sherpa friends. So um, he, he has a whole community uh, of Sherpas who are like family to him. And, and we got to know them, which was a fun part of it. Um, but who was on the trip? Um, there's Tony. This is at Annapurna Base Camp. Uh, there's Matt and myself right there. This is Joel. And Joel is um, a, a son of one of Tony's good friends. Tony lives in England, and, or in the UK. Um, and so Joel is a student at Oxford. He was an art student and also really interested in religious studies. So it was great to have him along because he was really engaged with Tony's work and all along the trail was really engaged in the art of, of the monasteries and the religion and what everything meant. And he, he was a great friend. Um, and then Kurt, as we mentioned before, uh, <clears throat> was along as well. And then in terms of our support, we had really great Sherpas. And so these are all friends of Tony's who have gone on multiple trips with him in the past. Um, we have Nawang who came with us on the big circuit while Tony was painting. Um, we have Ram and Deepak. Um, and then not pictured are Angnerbu and Lakpa, who are kind of the uh, heads of the family. So they're all, they're all kind of um, related to one another. And Angnerbu and Lakpa were um, Tony's main connections that go back a ways. Cool, yeah. So. In terms of our arriving there, as, as we kind of mentioned, we had this super nebulous plan to go and just visit a bunch of friends of ours, wherever they may be. And so we were coming from Vietnam. And before that, Skylar had been in Cambodia and China. Um, and that's a picture of me sleeping in the, an airport in Malaysia. Um, and so we kind of flew in with this huge like 24-hour travel day from Vietnam to Malaysia to Nepal and then loaded up. Uh, they'd sent a couple guys to pick us up at the airport, which was super nice, and loaded all our crap on top of the, the uh, van. And uh, Tony and Joel had already arrived, and so they were kind of at the hotel in downtown Kathmandu waiting for us. So we arrived in Kathmandu and spent a couple days with Tony. Um, and as Matt said, we met, we met up with the rest of the party. Um, half of our time on the front end of Kathmandu was just logistics. So we arrived. Uh, the first thing I had to do was get a new debit card because I had just been pickpocketed in Cambodia. Um, we had to rent a bunch of gear. So we rented um, cold, uh, you, know, you know, heavy overcoats and sleeping bags for, for the trek. Um, so we were kind of zooming around doing logistics, as well as Tony was zooming around um, picking up some souvenirs to put in his paintings that he knew he wanted, so various colored dyes. And, and things that he knew he wanted to collect. And so this is kind of what the, the market sector of Kathmandu looks like. And it, it's very busy. Uh, we, would, we would go to all these outdoor gear outfitters um, that were friends of the Sherpas who were with us. And they were all very happy to see Tony. Tony has been there a few times over the years and seems to really um, be good friends with, with everyone there. Um, so, so that was kind of a fun logistics day. Um, the, the other interesting part was we were driving a van, a, a white van of seven people through streets like this. And these streets are super narrow and tall 
And several times we got stuck trying to make turns that just are not fit for a van. And it would take about five or six minutes to like weasel our way around this corner and traffic would stop and everyone was really patient. Oh, really? No one was honking. It was as if that was just normal <laughs> business. And then the streets flood again with people. And so that was a fun, that was our introduction to Kathmandu in terms of running around and taking care of some logistics. <clears throat> the other part of our first few days, couple days in Kathmandu was sightseeing. So I think we had two days and we jammed a lot of um, tourism in there as well. So we, we visited a lot of the religious sites. Um, Kathmandu is a heavily religious place. Um, both Hinduism and Buddhism is everywhere in the city. Um, so we visited a few holy sites. This one here is Buddhanath, and it's, a, it's one of the largest Buddhist stupas in the world. Um, and there are thousands of people there walking around it in a clockwise direction, as is custom. Tony was very engaged with the locals everywhere we went. Like I said, even just renting gear, he seemed to know everyone here. It was at Budanoth, and there was a painter under a canvas um, painting something to put up on the wall of this temple. And, and he peeked his head in, and, and they connected as artists, and they kind of shared insights on the techniques. Um, oh, sorry, there's a question. Yeah, is everyone speaking English? Um, I'd say most people didn't speak English. It's not like traveling in Europe. Um, so we, we had our Sherpas with us, and they, they would translate. Tony doesn't really speak uh, Nepali. So here, here's Tony peeking his head and talking to this local artist. And here's Joel, the art student from Oxford, who was also really engaged with that. Um, <clears throat> but everywhere we went, Tony's talking to people, translating, cracking jokes, like just connecting with people. And, and picking up little souvenirs along the way, many of which end up in his uh, pieces. Um, so it was really, really, one, one of the coolest things as a tourist was to see religion in action. Um, because a lot of uh, religious sites you'll visit as a tourist are just tourist sites. And you go, I was just in Cambodia before this, and all the temples are filled with uh, you know, Americans and Australians viewing it as this relic. But all the religious sites we visited in Kathmandu were really active and full of the, the people there worshiping, and, and that was really, uh, really strong. And so not only um, would we visit religious sites scattered throughout the city, but ever, everywhere you went in the streets, religion was spilling out onto the streets. So there are these little, um, little stupas, little shrines on every street corner, and people passing by will stop and make a prayer or, or you know, touch, um, touch the statue for good luck and, and that kind of thing. So religion was just really present in the city. Yeah, so it's, it's some sort of um, custom to put this red powder. Um, I would butcher the significance if I tried, but it's like something about the color red. Um, you, you put a little red powder on, on the um, stupa as you go by. Um, so just, this is just another example of a holy site we visited. Um, the first one I showed you was Buddhist, and this was, one's Hindu which was another interesting part of Kathmandu, just the coexistence and overlap of Hinduism and Buddhism was really present. And this one is called Pashupatanath Temple. Um, and it's a site where the god Shiva was um, uh, known to have meditated and actually transformed into a deer. So there's all this lore around this site. And um, one of the shocking things was there were actually cremations going on alongside this river. This is um, the Bagmati River, which is a holy river. And on these little um, pedestals here along the river, there are people being cremated and then um, dipped into the water, or, or one before the other. Um, so that, that was just another example of like, the religion is, is so visceral in this city. Yeah, so this is another shot of the Bagmati River, um, the same one as as was in uh, the last shot with the temple and the cremations, and just sort of just show like a, a flip side of um, Kathmandu and like the river's a good little case study in that. Um, all, everything you see on the banks there is trash. So that is like, you know, I think it's very common, at least in, in my short experience, to go on travels and want to come back and like report that everything was fantastic and beautiful and like how excellent, but there are also like things that are you know less awesome when you're, when you're out there, and so you know sort of really confronting the the reality that Nepal is going through right now 
and that comes with having a third world country experience of like massive population boom without any planning was another thing that we really saw, um, especially in Kathmandu, but, but really throughout our, our whole time there. And so, you, you know, as you can see, like this, this is a holy river that is just overflowing with trash because you know, they, they just don't have the infrastructure and facilities to, um, to really manage it all. And that, that, like when I was there, kind of put me off, but then also got me thinking in a lot bigger sense about sort of like the importance of civic planning and the importance of, you know, or, or like also confronting that Nepal is a, a third world country. And, you know, mo most of what I knew about Nepal was like, oh yeah, Mount Everest and like all these majestic Himalayan mountains. And I hadn't really thought about the fact like, oh yeah, this is, uh, a, you know, they're one spot above Haiti on the World Development Index. Um, and so, you know, experiencing that was a, a big part of being there as well. So this is just another example of uh, some of the stuff we saw on the street um, and of like, you know, this, this whole country modernizing, which is, you know, we were there in kind of a super fascinating juncture. So this is, this is an electrical pole. Um, and as you can see, just about everyone and their brother in the city is tapping into it. Um, and so, you know, this was really crazy to see. Also, like, the willingness of just average people to walk up and try and, like, mess around with the electrical lines is pretty insane. And, you know, this, this is, like, a, one example of a number that we, we saw when we were there that were pretty crazy, um, crazy things that the whole country is going through as they grow. Uh, another example is they're building a new ring road in, in Kathmandu. Um, this is four years ago, so they're probably well, well along the process now. Um, but in, in building the ring road, the government basically said, you know, hey, we need to add two more lanes. Uh, but as you can see, buildings are kind of built up and right up to the street. And property law and uh, ownership rights are a little less established there. And so as part of the ring road, they were chopping off the front of a bunch of buildings that, you know, were people's houses and businesses and all this stuff. And so they were causing a bunch of controversy there as well. Um, was that before or after the ring road? This is a year before. Yeah. yeah. But you can imagine how this kind of uh, an area would have fared. <clears throat> so, um, like we said, that, that was our couple days in Kathmandu, jam-packed sightseeing and logistics. Um, and then we set out, we left Tony behind and, and went around this loop. Um, so, uh, Kathmandu is like down here. Tony was going to spend a couple weeks like I said, painting down here. So, so we had to get from Kathmandu um, up into here. And since we were uh, condensing our timing a bit to catch up with Tony, we actually drove as far as we could, as far as there's a road, which is up here into Chame. So it's common to walk this, but we decided to, to get there via car. So we took a, a bus from Kathmandu to Besi Sahar, and then from Besi Sahar to Bulabula. And then this is uh, an off-road Jeep trip. That was quite the experience. <laughs> that we'll mention, um, but that, that's kind of the f overview of where we were. So, like I said, we were heading out on a three-week trek, and little did we know that the bus ride there was gonna be half of the journey. Um, so this is kind of the, the Greyhound equivalent of a bus that we took from Kathmandu out. And um, we, we piled in, and as we're leaving Kathmandu, every 100 yards or so, the, the bus would kind of slow down and, and roll at, you know, a few miles per hour. And these two teenage boys who were in the front of the bus kind of running the show would hop out while the bus is moving, haggle with the people on the side of the road, and then you know, come to a deal. They would, they would hop on while the bus is still moving, and then we'd, we'd keep going. So, so that was kind of getting out of Kathmandu for the first few hours. The bus just kept getting more and more full as these boys were you know, running in and out. <laughs> and, um, I like the price ticket the prices and how many people were in your party and that kind of thing. Um, passengers have to run too? Sorry? The passengers yeah, have to run? they're kind of jogging along with us. <laughs> yeah. and, and part of it was like, do you want a seat or are you okay standing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and then we get out of the city and we're on these mountainside roads and this driver was insane, <laughs> as well as really skilled. <laughs> so. He, he was basically screaming around corners, constantly on his horn instead of his brake, <laughs> passing, passing small cars. Um, the entire seven hour drive, I was just bracing for impact and it never came, luckily. Um, so that was our first experience of, of getting around. The second leg of this bus journey 
was we, we made it to this city, Bessie Sahar, and that was kind of the long distance bus, and we were then gonna take more of a local bus. So this was a local bus that was just a couple hours bus ride, and it's these really fun buses that are really decorated, um, you know, full of colors on the inside. And at the bus stop, we didn't have tickets or anything, and we, we get to the bus, and it's already jam-packed, and there's a Dutch couple in front of us trying to get on the bus, and they get turned down because it was too crowded. Luckily, our guide, um, a Sherpa, then talks to the bus driver, and next thing we know, we're getting on the bus, all seven of us. They throw our bags on top. Um, somehow, for some reason, it's unclear to, me, to this day how we got seats on this bus. It's either out of um, the, the locals who had seats were courteous and gave us seats, or we actually had tickets that entitled us to seats, but we ended up getting seats on this bus, and we start going. And what I thought was a packed bus already just gets more and more and more crowded. So, did, I mean, when I've traveled seven years ago, they would have people on top of the bus as well. Yeah. yeah. So it was already more crowded than I could thought was possible, and probably 30, 40 more people got on this bus Similar situation where you'd pull over and pick a few people up along the way. And by the time we got out of the city, people were on the roof. We were totally sardines inside this bus. And it seemed to be par for course because people were not distressed or uncomfortable. Everyone, no one batted an eye. It was just normal bus ride in, in the outskirts of Nepal. And the most uh, interesting thing that happened on this bus ride was uh, a woman who was about our age had a baby with her like a, I want to say a year or two old baby, and she was kind of standing up and squished, and I was sitting down, and she passed me her baby. <laughs> so I had a baby on my lap for this <laughs> two-hour bus ride. And uh, it wasn't a big deal. Like, she just trusted me and didn't ask any questions, and it was great. <laughs> so that was a fun experience. Um, and so that got us, that got us um, two-thirds of the way of our car journey to the trailhead. Oh yeah, so yeah, so that was about two thirds of the way there. And the last third was on this Jeep road that they were building and it was kind of making progress. Eventually it would go all the way to Manong, um, but for now it just went to Chame. And uh, you know, because it was kind of a big wide Jeep road, rather than hike it and have Jeeps whizzing by us so much of dust, we kind of, the Sherpas talked us into like, you know, the better way to do this is just drive it and then you can spend your time hiking the parts without cars. Um, and so we said, you know, sounds good um, and, and hopped in the Jeep and can I see that pointer for a second? Yeah, yeah so this is the road. <laughs> and as you can see, it's, it's literally blasted in the side of a cliff face and uh, we were driving, I mean, it, it was, road is like a very generous term. It's, it's like, there are huge rocks in there, like you're bouncing up and down the whole time. Um, this picture on the right is actually a, an area where a waterfall had caused, had basically carved like a trench in the road. And we were able to drive over it, but a car coming the other way got stuck. And so our, like, our, you know, we'd stop to sort of help them figure out how to get across it. Um, and uh, it, it was a wild day in, in this bus. You know, again, going super fast on this cliff face with like, you know, a thousand foot drop into a river. You know, every turn's a blind turn, but instead of braking, you just honk. And then theoretically, the, the other cars coming the other would hear you and not come. But, um, you know, we, we made it. And then the last, I'd say the last like hour of this, because this is about a full day, like an, probably an eight hour drive. In the last hour of it, we had uh, the beginnings of what would be a long few days with dysentery. Um, and so we're not, we're not quite sure where we picked that up, but um, as you can imagine, if you're, you're starting to feel like you have the stomach flu, um, riding in a Jeep over roads, bouncing up and down the entire way was uh, l less than ideal. But we all, you know, we all made it out without um, tossing our cookies in the Jeep and, and made it to Chame. Okay, yeah, so this, in the next few slides, we're just kind of talk, going to talk a little about, um, you know, once we got to Chame and sort of rode out the period of throwing up and not being able to keep any food in us, uh, thankfully it only lasted a couple days and we were able to move on and start getting into a regular routine of hiking every day, which was like, you know, a, what the majority of the trip was like. 
and it was really awesome. So on the left, just a picture of us kind of taking a stop for a little photo op hiking. Um, on the right is a picture of dal bat, which is um, kind of a ubiquitous meal um, on, on the circuit and in Nepal in general. And it's an, I mean, an excellent deal. You basically get some curried vegetables, some rice, uh, some dal, which is lentils, and it's all you can eat. So every, every time we would stop to eat, we'd pretty much have dal bot for the next three weeks. What's in the bowl? Uh, up top or down below? Up top and down below. That, I believe, is chicken. Um, <laughs> Yeah, curried chicken. But, and some of them had meat, some of them didn't. And that varied a little bit depending on elevation as well. So you know, the higher you get, you can't really have livestock or, or animals because all of a sudden you're in the snow. Um, so all of you know, the second half when we were in high, higher elevation was uh, more vegetarian, but we were still pretty low when this picture was taken. Um, yeah, so an average day we'd kind of wake up and we'd probably wake up at 5 or 6 a.m. And, and start hiking. And we would hike until about noon and then stop for lunch for half an hour or so, then hike for another two hours or two and a half hours and arrive at uh, a tea hut. And so these tea huts are where we stayed the entire duration of our, our trek, um, both on the Annapurna circuit and with Tony. And the tea huts are like little sort of bread and breakfast type joints, um, but in Nepal. So. You know, th these, these buildings here are an example of like the kind of tea hut we'd stay in. So they're very simple structures. You know, you basically get some bunks or a little room to yourself. And they have, they cook you food, they serve you tea. Um, and it was, lo lodging was like a, the equivalent of like a dollar a night. So it was really a very affordable way to do it. Um, and they were all these little towns. I mean, that, that was one thing I wasn't really expecting was that Hiking through Nepal, you know, I kind of thought, you know, it's just gonna, you know, gonna be a, kind of like a wilderness trek. Um, but there were just little villages everywhere. And so it's like, you know, you hike and there are no settlements or anything around for a few hours, and then you come to a little village. Um, and this is, you know, a good example of these little villages just in, with just like outrageous cool views. Um, yeah, then once, once we would, uh, arrive at our destination usually or in, in kind of mid-afternoon, like clockwork, it would start snowing. So on, on, on the left is uh, one of the few examples of us not quite making it in before the snow. Um, but that was, that was a pretty high elevation. I think you can see some yaks in that, that photo, um, which were only present at the higher elevations. And then uh, you know, we'd get there and it's only 2 p.m. and there's you know, pretty limited electricity and no Wi-Fi or anything like that. So. We're, we're just hanging out, reading books. Um, I think by the end of the journey, every book that we, he, we brought with us, we had kind of done a round robin with, and everyone had read every book. Um, and chess was a little bit of a rarity, but that, you know, a, welcome, a welcome break in the action. Played a lot of hearts. Played a lot of cards, game. yeah. We brought a card deck with us and played a lot of hearts. Yeah. So that was kind of a typical day on this you know, two-week trek before we met up with Tony. Um, another interesting thing, just like in Kathmandu where religion was spilling out onto the streets, religion was everywhere on the trail as well. Um, so down here are prayer wheels, and you, you'd encounter prayer wheels along the way every few miles or so. And, and these are, um, they have Buddhist significance. And just like I said, you circumvent the stupas in a clockwise direction. As you go by these prayer wheels, they're actually little spinning uh, metal cylinders in here and you're supposed to spin the prayer wheels as you go by in a clockwise direction, um, just on the trail. Um, most towns had some sort of monastery up in the hills, so sometimes if we'd get there and it's not raining yet, we'd walk up to the monastery and, and we could meet the monks and they'd, they'd show us inside and all that. Um, there are prayer flags everywhere, um, at, you know, which are meant to kind of catch the wind and spread prayers throughout the mountains. Um, and, and like I said, in the monasteries, there were really, really intricate paintings covering all the walls and ceilings. And so uh, Joel especially was interested in the paintings as an art student and religious, uh, religious studies student. And so he was always looking at them really closely and saying, okay, to our guide, Nawang, Nawang, what, what does this mean? What's going on here? There's a lot of meaning in these people, you know, being, you know, put in a boiling pot and what's going on here. And Nawang's answer for everything was, oh, it's for good luck. <laughs> and so Joel was never quite satisfied in, in his search for meaning. Um, it might have been a language barrier, <laughs> or Nawang hadn't studied as much. But 
That was a fun joke. Uh, another interesting thing on the trail out there was, as Matt said, the road only goes as far as Chame, which is maybe a third of this whole circuit, and there are tea house uh, villages every hour or two on the trail. So there are a fair amount of people up there living and farming and, and tending to the tourists. Um, but everything up there is carried in on the backs of the people. Actually, not on the backs, but on the foreheads. So the, the way that they carry weight is not in a backpack, but they actually take a strap and put it over their forehead and carry all the weight kind of on their back, but going through their forehead and neck. So we multiple times saw people um, carrying enormous weights on their forehead and, and through their necks like that. Everything from, you know, Literally everything, so food, beverages. We'd see Coca-Cola and Snickers bars up there um, to construction beams. And, and um, folks like these are wearing uh, flip-flops or old tennis shoes and just navigating some pretty crazy trails with huge loads. Yep, so another really cool thing about the circuit um, was that we started at a you know, relatively low elevation for Nepal. It was about 2,500 feet um, here in Bulbalay when we where we started. And it was it was kind of best described as jungleish. You know, we were in t-shirts and shorts, and uh, it was really humid, really hot. And then you know we we basically walked for the next two and a half weeks, and just from walking every day, hiking, um, experienced all sorts of crazy different different biomes. And so, you know, we started kind of in jungle area, made our way up to sort of a more classic alpine area. And, and this is uh, near Manong, where it was around 11,000 feet. So this is probably like a few days after um, the, the previous photo. And then, you know, from this like relatively sort of high desert alpine area, we moved into like proper snow. Um, and this is going over Thorong La Pass, which is the highest point on our uh, on our track and in the Annapurna Circuit, and that's almost 18,000 feet. Um, and then in that same day, from from going from you know 15,000 feet to 18,000 feet, we dropped all the way back down to 12,000 feet um, in uh, in the rain shadow of the Himalayas. So this is over you know kind of more near like we'd seen like Pakistan or, or uh, you know. The, the Himalayas that are more desertish, which is a really crazy, uh, crazy day because basically, you know, every single day we've been hiking and it get a little bit snowier, a little bit snowier, a little bit higher, and then all of a sudden we were in the desert. Um, so that was pretty cool, and and the elevation was also kind of a factor as we were going through it that was playing on people's minds. It was like, you know, we're going to 18,000 feet. Is it going to be hard? Is it going to like not affect us? And uh, I ended up being pretty much fine. I was, I was worried about it the day before, because at 15,000 feet, I remember thinking, oh, the air is getting a little thin, like this is getting pretty hard. But then going over the pass itself, it wasn't too bad. Um, I don't know, what, what did you and Joel think? I'd... I was feeling it a lot more than Matt was. <laughs> 18,000 feet was the first time I ever felt like I was really short on breath, and you'd take some, you'd walk and then stop, and then realize that you were really lightheaded, and you had to catch your breath and kind of keep going. Um, so, yeah, it, it was really uh, interesting just to go gradually, gradually, gradually and, and kind of realize the point at which you start feeling the effects of altitude. Uh, yeah, but then, like Matt said, we dropped immediately down to 12,000 that same day. Yeah. Yeah, and then so from uh, Mukhtanov, which is at 12,000 there, and that's like the irony of the crazy elevation of the Himalayas is we were at 12,000 feet. We were like, oh, phew, we can breathe again. There's so much oxygen down here. Whereas if we were to go, you know, hike all day at 12,000 feet right now, we'd be wheezing. Um, so we dropped into Mukhtanoth and then kept going kind of down the circuit as it descended. And uh, the last sort of climb we ran into was these, you know, really impressive rhododendron forests with, you know, I'm not sure how well you can see it, but there are all sorts of cairns built up and little rivulets running through things. So this is one of my favorite biomes that I had no idea existed in Nepal at all. And it you know, just felt like you're in Lord of the Rings. Like everything is so lush and green and these crazy gnarled trees. So that was um, about two weeks of uh, Matt and I and Joel and Kurt and our Sherpas while Tony was doing his thing. 
um, down in the lower left corner of this map. Uh, so Tony was down here painting, um, and, and the largest painting um, in his collection from this journey was, or sorry, no, the, not the largest, but one of the four was made from around here uh, while we did this. And so we met up with Tony in Tatapani down here. And um, the, we, we made it into the, the tea house where he was staying at about two or three as it was starting to rain. And he, he's up in the little like common area of this tea house. Oh, sorry, this is the painting he made while we were out and about for a couple of weeks. So we meet up with Tony in Tatapani and he whipped out his uh, scroll on this painting that he had been making. So, sorry to keep zooming back and forth. Th this is the painting he had essentially completed fr from this area. When we met up with him, he had been right around here for the last week or so working on a painting, which was this one, wh which he was about a third of the way done when we, when we met up with him, uh, which ended up being this guy, uh, which is the large one out here you'll see in the set. So here, I mean, A, it was really cool to see this, this painting of his that was uh, in the works, and he was telling us all about the challenges he was facing. Like, he had been here for about a week and was having a lot of issues with the clouds and getting a clear shot of Machu Picchu. So every day, he'd set out and walk up this hill that he and his uh, Sherpa Ram had found, and they would try to get a good view and maybe get 20 minutes here or there. And so he was kind of bitter and frustrated with this process because he came all the way out to Nepal and then was, was having trouble getting a, a good view. So he was sharing his experiences with us on that. Um, and he was joking, you know, while we were out and having fun, he was at work. And so he was ready to join the fun portion of the trip. And he was really excited to see us. Yeah, so, it, I mean, it was interesting seeing his process as well. Yeah, I mean, the process is really cool because, you know, part of getting to see these works in action is you could ask him all sorts of questions like, you know, so are all those little plants there? Um, are you making them up? Like, how does that work? And he kind of said, oh, you know, I kind of get as much as I can while I'm there. But as you can see, you know, it, it's, it's maybe halfway done here, a third of the way done. Um, and the next day we had to hike. And so he, he said he would take really detailed notes for himself um, on sort of what he wanted to see and then finish everything back in Cornwall. You know, it was just cool to sort of hear about his process and hear that, oh, yeah, you know, if, if the image seems a little unbalanced, maybe I'll sort of um, improvise a little and add, add a tree there that maybe, you know, maybe it was there, maybe it wasn't. So that, that was fun. Yeah, so we had this great reunion with Tony, and then we had about a, a five day or a week trek uh, up to reach the Annapurna Sanctuary, which is uh, the base camp where you can see Machu Picchu close up. So we, we had some good times with Tony on the trail. Yep, and it was, it was a very welcome sort of change. Oh yeah, go ahead. Just curious, when you're hiking, uh, <laughs> yeah, good question. It, it kind of depended. The I mean, question was, uh, when we're hiking, yeah. what do we carry versus what are the Sherpas carrying? Yep, so the, it depended a little bit. So the Sherpas were, for the most part, carrying all of Tony's gear, for sure. And we, we had a couple porters with us, you know, specifically to help carry stuff. And for the most part, I'd say I was carrying almost all of my own stuff. Um, but, you know, there, like we had, we packed everything we had for like the entirety of our six month trip or whatever. And so, every, you know, certain days I, we'd kind of like switch out different stuff we might need and like hand off a jacket or something to the, to the porters. Um, yeah, I don't know what. Yeah, I, I would say they were carrying, you, unlike backpacking, we didn't have tents and like we weren't carrying food and stoves and that kind of thing. So there wasn't a lot of common weight. Um, and we were mostly carrying our own things, but they were carrying some of our things and, and whatever common weight there was. There's actually a rule that they're not allowed to carry more than I think 50 pounds or something. Um, and so, and Tony is very respectful of how he treats the Sherpas and they're all friends. And so um, I, I think that rule gets broken a lot, especially when they're competing for business. Um, but we were, I mean, certainly not like that. Um, yeah, we weren't pushing the limits. Yeah. Um, and, and I was, it's interesting you bring it up because I, when we first started, I was, uh, who knows why, either, either for machismo or because I was like, you know, uh, pinching pennies as, as a grad student. But I was, when we first sort of had the porters added on, I was like, oh, what are these porters here for? You know, like we only really need one for Tony's stuff. Like I don't need someone to help carry my stuff. 
Um, and then later had it kind of explained to me, like, you know, the $2 a day we're giving these kids is, you know, going a huge way to improve their lives and, like, completely not changing ours. And so after that, I was a lot more gracious and, like, thankful to have Porter's there and, like, just kind of be able to be involved in the community versus doing it more solo. Yeah. Oh, so th this, is, this here is sort of a, <laughs> a montage of... Um, how the transition to hiking with Tony went, and it was fantastic, just like, you know, first things first. Um, I think we had a lot more sort of, I don't know if it was competition or just like wanting to get places, but we'd been hiking pretty hard and pretty fast. Um, and when we met Tony, he was basically just like, all right, we're chilling out. You know, he's like, we're gonna hike, we're gonna have a tea break every 90 minutes. Um, and, you know, it was very, very mellow, very jolly. And uh, you know, one of the things that Tony said to me, like as it was a really good influence on me to like slow down and enjoy where I was, because he said something along the lines of like, you know, this is the point. Like we were out here to walk through all of this and enjoy it, not to race to the tea hut and sit inside in a tea hut all day. Um, and so you know, he was just a great hiking companion and an excellent influence on our group. Yeah, not not to mention uh, just once we get to the tea house, a great person to have you know a few hours to hang out with because he has so many stories and he's just like the most fun person to to travel with he, he's really jovial and ha has a lot uh really has a good time um just to call out these photos so this is us at the first tea house when we met up with him I, th I think and he's pointing and showing us kind of the uh scope of the painting he was doing so machu Pichar is actually up here in the clouds so we were traveling up this river valley towards the sanctuary, which was in here. Uh, th this is the back of Tony's head, kind of what the trail looked like. It was just up and down, up and down over these ridges with thousands of stairs. Um, and this is one of the tea huts along the way, Tony with his little uh, periscope <laughs> looking up at Machu Pichari. So it was really fun to be kind of, to have the end in sight the entire way. You could see the, the fishtail of Machu Pichari poking out ahead and we were kind of getting progressively closer. What month was the year? Uh, this was all of April, yeah. So as we're walking up this valley towards the Machu Pichari Sanctuary, um, it, you couldn't help but become overwhelmed with like the scale of the mountains around you. And that was a theme on the Annapurna circuit, as we were going around, you, you're looking towards the mountains and there were 26, 28,000 foot peaks, which was just kind of mind blowing. And now we're going up into the middle of it and being surrounded by those peaks. So these are some of us down here and this is just the, the glacial valley wall that we're walking up. And so it was just kind of an overwhelming scale and it, it kind of felt like we were walking in a Tony Foster painting where you see these big landscapes. It, it just felt immense like that. So it was a really cool experience. And then finally we get to the sanctuary. Yeah, it, arriving at the sanctuary, I mean, I, I don't really know what my expectations were, but it exceeded whatever they may have been. It was you know, just by far the most beautiful place I've ever been. And uh, to put it in context, like here, here's a shot of Tony painting Machu Pichari. And uh, Machu Pichari obviously is a, a really cool mountain and it's a sacred mountain. It was pretty much like sitting in a bowl with mountains that size in every single direction, you know, 300 degrees around you, just about with the valley making a narrow path down it. And so that was just, you know, incredibly awe-inspiring. And we, we woke up at about 4.30 a.m. to get up there so that Tony would have, you know, a clear chunk of daylight um, and to, to paint, you know, as much as he could and, and sketch out as much as he could of the painting. Um, and then it started to snow really hard, and so we went back down. At this point, we're on a glacier, so we, we went back down the, uh, the glacier to um, the Mach, Machu Putri base camp. And so a little bit about Machu Putri while, while we have this close-up of it here is when we were up here, we saw climbing expeditions getting ready to go climb Annapurna. Um, and Machu Putri itself has never been summited because it's considered to be the birthplace of Shiva, so it's a, it's a sacred mountain. And sometime in the 20th century, a, a team of British climbers came within a couple hundred yards of the summit um, and turned back out of respect for you know, the religion of the Nepali people. So it's kind of cool that it's been respected like that. Yeah. So that was kind of the, 
the climax, the destination of, of the trip, and it was really amazing to be there. Um, and, and so after Tony had gone to paint, and, and we were just soaking in the beauty of this amazing arena of mountains, um, we, we cruised back down the valley that we had just come back up, <clears throat> so it took a few more days to get back down. Uh, so, so this is Tony here painting Machu Picchari, and, and this is the product he ended up with. So now all the pressure was off. We had gone there. Tony was able to, to paint in clear view. Uh, it, it felt like the job was done, kind of. And hiking down again, descending into the more jungle environment. Um, at, at one point, so, so now it's more humid. It's hotter. There are hot springs that were stopping in along the way. Um, Tony kind of feels inspired by this river and decides to stop and start painting. And about uh, 30 minutes in, it starts to rain because it's 2.30. And a little local, tiny little local home uh, allowed Tony to sit on their front porch out of the rain and continue to paint. So for a couple hours, we sat here. Joel, Matt, and I were kind of playing around in the river. We came up and sat next to Tony and watched him, watched him paint. And, and this was uh, just a really awesome experience to watch Tony paint and, and all of his techniques. Um, this is his paint box. It's the size of like a cigarette box or something, and he, he has you know 16 different colors that he's able to turn into this. Um, he uses a, a Tupperware lid as his palette, so he's sitting there with his little paint box and his Tupperware lid, and being being very deliberate with each brush stroke. Um, so it, it was really fascinating um, just to to watch a professional do his thing. Um, and one of the things that struck me was it kind of changed the way how I viewed this scene that he was looking at, because I would look at this river and see gray rocks and green trees and blue water, and he was using like 100 different colors. And each rock, he would you know, change the color 10 times. And so it was just cool to see from Tony's perspective how he viewed nature and how he kind of translated that onto the page. Um, and it was also really great to see how he interacted with the locals. I mean, it, it wasn't the first time we had seen it all along the way. He was just extremely courteous, and so they took him onto his front porch. Of course, he had his tea with a bunch of sugar in it, and he made sure to share the tea and the crackers that he was having. Um, he made sure we all bought some chocolates from them and just kind of made friends with these people for a couple hours as he painted. Uh, so that was a really special kind of uh, just experience of watching Tony in his element. So that was uh, pretty much the, the end of our trip. Um, you know, we walked back out, took a bus to Pokhara, which is the nearby big city, and then um, kind of, I think we spent a night there and came back to Kathmandu. And the last night of the trip back in Kathmandu, we, uh, we went back to Aengnerbu and Lakpa's home. So this is Aengnerbu and Lakpa. These are Tony's Sherpa friends from, uh, they go back like 30 years. And uh, they took us into their home and fed us an amazing dinner and treated us like family gave us these Buddhist scarves for good luck. And, uh, and, and just, it was a really special way to kind of conclude this trip. And I thought it kind of illustrated how Tony treats everyone like family. He treated us like family. He, these Sherpas are family to him. And uh, he really like embraces and connects with all the places he goes, both in the nature and the culture and the people there. Um, so that was kind of how it all wrapped up. <clears throat> So yeah, share the foster. If, uh, if we can give a... Thank you guys. Let's, um, yeah, thank you guys so much for coming. It's such, yeah. a, such a treat for us to be able to have all these different perspectives. And I feel like as foster staff, we're learning so much from these experiences that we can then convey to people that come visit us. Um, so yeah, thank you guys so much. Uh, and that'll conclude our video.